Uh, it's great to visit the past, not in order to indulge in it and get stuck in it, but in order to inform our present moment and um, make a positive trajectory to the future that we want to, to live. Um, often we get stuck in the past, uh, so we can tell that we like the story that we tell ourselves about ourselves and to remember that in, in the end no matter what is the story it's just a story and let us use our stories as a maneuver to inform our present moment how do we want to live this life how do we want to live this gift and that it's um totally up to our responsibility to inform the future when we name the future, when we name what we want to, how we want to live, how we want to act and be, we actually extract from the universe all what is needed for that vision. So thoughts and words are just so important. Maybe that's why um, among so many brothers and sisters in life, uh, all the animal kingdom and uh, plant kingdom, we are the ones who were gifted the gift of language, the gift of words, uh, the gift of describing what's going inside of us into words so we can communicate. And look what, we communicate in so many languages that also can create so many misunderstandings. <laughs> I was born in occupied Palestine in the Galilee, uh, close to Nazareth, the city of Jesus, grown up as a Muslim in an indigenous tribe, as a female body, and as Palestinian, Arab. So many identities that I did not choose. So many identities that were, uh, maybe one can also say, our soul in the cosmic realm did very consciously choose where, would be, we, where we would incarnate in a material level so we can um, add healing to our soul journey and nevertheless um, growing up into this reality I, I was very aware that all these identities that i just mentioned my skin color my my body my gender all of this i did not choose and uh, finding out that these identities um, were played against me <laughs> so to grow in a female body and uh, a patriarchal society and that patriarchal society is maybe a little bit more than other patriarchal societies and patriarchy exists on a scale on a spectrum still in uh, the fertile crescent and i say fertile crescent not middle east as middle east is a colonial term I call the land as a fertile crescent also to the possibility of that land to be fertile and crescent as the moon is uh, what a culture we would be if we would follow the moon and her rhythm what a feminine culture we would be if we would follow the moon mm. so patriarchy is a spectrum and i was born also as a indigenous person to an indigenous tribe that in, in the rush of modernity lost the connection to indigenous roots so most of the people around me including myself until a certain age we were rushing to modernity to the white modernity to the plastic dream that the global north is offering us or pretending where capitalism is painting that plastic dream as the ultimate dream for everybody and many of us get um, cheated in this and want to copy this um, the ways to this plastic dream and um, get rid of our faults of our ways uh, of being um, land-based communities, communities that knows how to grow food, how to harvest water, how to create sustainable frames where we live together. So me too, I also was trying to hide my indigenous roots. So I fit into, assimilate into a norm. I grew up as a a uh, Palestinian minority in my own land, uh, a foreigner in my own land, in my, uh, yeah, the land of my roots and my people. And being seen from birth as an enemy for a state that decided because of colonial movement 
to be a state for Jewish people based on a fear and trauma that was inflicted on these people, these people inflicting now a trauma and pain on us. So witnessing the cycle of victim perpetrator being repeated and repeated. And being born as a Muslim, although I'm not so connected to the religion, I'm connected to the spirituality of the, this religion, but not to the institution in times of Islamophobia. And now I find myself living in Europe in times where there is so much fear from foreigners, rejection to refugees, um, fear from the other. So I find myself um, again and again in places where I am challenged to grow to the next phase of love. And despite all what I'm, I just described uh, as, a, as a, a child, as a teenager, and also until now, I feel that there's a huge amount of love inside of me that did not get corrupted by all these means of oppression. And as a child, I was walking and asking, where would I place these gifts? I love, you're rejecting me and I love. I mean, I come from the Arabic language where we have 14 terms, nouns, levels to describe love. 14 levels of love. And so I, uh, I was walking like uh, Mawlana Jalaluddin Rumi said, I was born as an undiscovered treasure. So I created the condition, conditions to be discovered. So I can see that in the story of my life, um, I and we all are born as undiscovered treasures. And it's up to our responsibility to, despite the outer conditions, to create conditions where these gifts that we came with from the divine world be discovered and it's a challenging process sometimes we see we get it we are on the wave we are in the zone and something else happens like this morning as i said before and you feel whoop you are back to the level of trauma and reaction and being betrayed and and it's a process it's a never-ending process of healing When I think of the younger generation um, globally, not even to come to people who, whom their identities is, are not welcome, I come immediately into a sadness and understanding that with our actions, we robbed the future generations from their right to have a, a good starting point in life. With what we did to Mother Earth, resources how we actually made that mother earth became resource first of all it's a living system that um by our actions and our lifestyle we don't give them a fair starting point so that their even their future is not um really uh, secured and it's a different starting point than than i started 50 years ago Back when I was um, a teenager, I didn't think, I didn't know, although the, 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 the actions, our actions, our collective actions on Mother Earth have been also seen, the results of it was also 50 years ago, but I was not in that danger that we, the younger generations feel now. And also we are coming from three years where the isolation um, was placed on all of us, but affected more the younger generation, because this is the age where you want to, you shape your identity um, related to others, interconnectedness, you, you grow um, by the mirrors of others. And the most of the younger generation had to spend three years um, under a mask and believing that the, the body of the human being is a source of disease and infection and being isolated. And this is a trauma that will um, still keep its uh, impact on us collectively. When I look into people from the global south and younger generation where in the age of internet and the accessibility of information, they see that the, their models for beauty, for um, wealth, for freedom of expression is what indicated by the global north, but they don't have that possibility. 
and there is raging anger inside of them. There is comparing and understanding that I will never be li like that model that is the standards of beauty and wealth that is represented in the internet and in the TV. I will never reach it. But that model is so close to me. It's like just far away of one screen. 50 years ago, this was not the case. This was, you would read a book, you would get inspired, you would, the models um, of your, how to become where you're in your neighborhood, in your community, in your village. And now that the, the role model are on the screen and far away from your reach. So the gap in, in the um, inner identity of the younger generation is so huge and difficult to bridge it. When people are um, trying to cross Africa into the Mediterranean, often young males, in order to escape the climate catastrophe that in Africa and to go to Europe and find themselves in a mass grave of the Mediterranean, the sea of my childhood, where I used to pass, it's one of the biggest cemeteries now where bones are under for young generation that are trying to flee the, the, the expected death and poverty to another life. And then they end in Europe or in the US forever, a second and third and fourth class, if at ever they will be legalized or uh, seen as equal. In, in times of white supremacy, uh, people with um, um, discriminated identities are facing a real danger in times of uh, Black Lives Matter, we need a collective answer to this. And it's because we are se severing the, 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 the ties between all of us and living a, a reality that is not good for us, for us collectively. And my uh, advice to a younger generation, so I say to my daughter, she's 21, so I'm, I accompany a uh, a Bedouin indigenous girl who is uh, who cho chose to live now in Berlin uh, because this is where she feels connected. And um, my advice to her and to others, and inclu including white young people, every all of us, my advice is root yourself in your own um, indigenous, uh, native, local knowledge. Go back to the identity that you feel comfortable with. Don't believe to the prison of white modernity that was created for us because of systems of oppression in the last 500 or 7,000 years of patriarchy. Go beyond it. Go back. Go back. You have the, the liberty to go as far as you want to the roots that you can, you can connect with and where you can harvest for us being proud of who you are, what you are, and bring it back to us. So we all can celebrate being rooted, being local, being native. So none of us is bizarre to Mother Earth. We are local and native when we are in contact with Mother Earth, wherever we are. And when we are rooted, we don't root other, uproot other people. As I grew up in uh, occupied Palestine and from a very young age, I understood that uh, my people, my I don't have a country, my people um, are under severe political situation. Um, I had to raise up for it. So I, I was arrested when I was 16 for expressing my views, uh, which actually I asked for peace. <laughs> That's all. That was my uh, accusation that I asked. I called for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And I was arrested as a, as a minor and it also left me a, a very big trauma in my um, understanding of like democracy. Uh, we are allowed to express our opinions and views but as long as they go with the state. And if you express something that uh, is not wished and to un I, very early, I understood that peace is not wished in the world. Peace is not wished in Israel, Palestine by the system because um, war, is uh, a factory, war is uh, beneficial, war is uh, financial growth, peace is not. Because we have also a very paled picture of peace. Peace is harmony and being slow and smooth. 
peace is vitality, peace is justice, peace is being one together. And this is not wished. And so I, that was a um, big disappointment for me to understand that so many people benefit from the state of war. And until now, it's one of the biggest questions for my activism and our activism in general, to see how the system of the society of war and violence is so coherent and so all the systems of oppression go to bed together. They are interlinked, they one feed the other. So if we want to create a culture of peace, we have to become as coherent, as strategy, as clear. What do we want? How do we imagine peace? What is peace? Peace is not the lack of war. Peace is a state of where our vital energy is there, our, our joy of life. Can we imagine that we all live a vital energy? And what is vital energy? Where does the topic of eros, love sexuality that vitality do we do we have a, an image of a society where it allows these energies to grow in in a, in a healthy way and unless we have images like this we will always think that peace is something just a lack of war very early in in my uh, uh youth i uh, understood that uh Societies are um, different in their way of not allowing you to become yourself. Each society is in a different way, but the main aim is not to allow you to be yourself. Also, also in the US, also in Germany, so many rules not to allow you to be yourself. So I understood that my sacred activism is first of all to be in so much connection with understanding what do I want? Who am I? To keep asking the question, who am I beyond all my identities, even beyond my gender, beyond my longings? Who am I? And I keep this question. This question can never be answered, a final answer. It's a, it's a quest. It's a quest in life. And it, it's good to create um, daily rituals to come back to this place of who am I? Where am I going? What do I want? So I understood that um, societies vary in how they don't become, want you to become yourself. And I noticed that almost all societies and all institutions of religion always have a say on my love. How do I love? So part of my activism was to really connect with that source of pure love that inside of me that is beyond the societies. I noticed that uh, if you want to predict what's happening in the world and where war will be next, <clears throat> there is a correlation between the state of women and young girls in that country, in that society, and the probability that that society or country will have a war or a conflict. And when, you, when I zoom to the state of women and girls, then it's always connected with how does that society evaluate makes the value of women? Are they equal? How, how um, second class or they are? And how is the topic of the freedom of um, personal, um, sexual, erotical love expression? There you can have a correlation between how this society or country will have a war or not. So I became a feminist uh, and a radical feminist to um, inform, to, to come to a space where um, we have a collective women empowerment, that we understand how does these systems of oppression are interlinking against us. And that our answer to these systems of oppression is never against man as an individual entity, but to awaken ourselves and men and see these systems of oppression, how they work together and dismantle them. And that's a lot of work, a lot of work and a lot of understanding. And I'm so happy that always in this feminist work, there were always uh, male bodies, men, masculine energy with us. And I'm so uh, grateful for this sacred masculinity, but also protect the feminine. 
so I became feminist and um, in the second intifada, I found myself alone with a child in Jerusalem uh, in a city exploded um, uh, under bombs, under buses that were exploding all the time. And I worked as a nurse treating the Jewish and the Palestinian at the same time. And I, at that moment, was, I was carrying life. And I, my promise to that life inside of my womb is that I will do all what I can so you can have a better starting point. I will change my life so I can give you life. And I noticed that my deep need as a woman, as a, as a female body, as a mother to become um, as Palestinian is to live in community. Because this is, it, was, it came as a cellular memory that I can't alone, that this understanding that these, um, individual individual uh, consuming frames uh, of the um, nuclear family that was created by the capitalist system where we are cut from each other and each wanting to have resources and machines and all the luxury in one house and where the topic of ownership is so becomes so sacred because we are um, our value becomes uh, equal to what we have as matter, and I, I, I scaled it up into humanity and I understood, aha, this is how the system is misusing us. We are slaves. <laughs> we are running in this hamster wheel all the time. Even me, I was working to be um, as a nurse to earn good money so I can pay the rent, um, have a good car, do good shopping, uh, buy um, all kinds of brands and go on vacation and, and I was like, oh, holy, mm, that's what we are doing. And then when my daughter was born, I was working even more to pay a, a babysitter so I can work more, so I can pay. <laughs> I was like, no, I will never get out of this hamster wheel. And came a very understanding also because I, I was born into a community. I was born into an extended family, to a tribe. It was a broken tribe, a broken heritage, but still, there, um, my, the first nine months of my daughter, I was in my parents' house, cuddled and loved and well taken care by the whole family, by my brothers and sisters. I was in a big trauma because I was um, neglected by my husband and uh, the father of the child and alone. When my father took me fully to his heart, my mother fully, my sisters, my brother. So the first nine months, I was just in that cradle, which allowed me also to get out of my depression and to wake up to, so what is the next step for my daughter? And I left that womb because I wanted to be on my own. I wanted my, uh, my freedom also as a woman to, to live in a patriarchal tribe was not easy. So I went back to Jerusalem, but very soon I understood that I'm, I'm back to the, the, to the trap and I will not serve that trap. So I understood that I want to live in community. And I'm thankful. I'm so thankful to uh, the universe that sent me this insight at that time. Because very quick, I um, uh, got to know Tamara and I got to know the whole concept of intentional community. A community that uh, the relatives are not only by blood, but by vision. There's a vision that is higher than us, brings us together. And I can speak later about being and living in community. Now, <clears throat> when I say a few more things about my political activism still back then, before I moved to Tamera, was the, I, very, I was very engaged in political uh, resistance, nonviolent resistance against the occupation and uh, feminist work and women work and uh, many things like this. But I, I felt that it was so fragmented because each um, fight or each uh, resistance was feeding only one aspect of me. And then another one, another aspect, but I could never find a place where all of my questions are gathered. So I didn't want to live fragmented. And nevertheless, within that uh, time of work was very important for me to bring back to my people 
um, the gift of sustainability, the gift of understanding that our own way, only way to uh, um, answer the occupation, to answer the political situation that we are in, is to come back to earth, to come back to our uh, to, to the to the land, to nourish it with love, to grow our food, to harvest, to create um, spaces of um, education where the local experts with the local students come together and celebrate the heritage that we have. And I had more than 10 years of this activism and I continue it. So we, I, my team uh, together also with the Gen Movement um, put our intention and our focus in one uh, traditional community in the West Bank that was living and still living a very sustainable regenerative lifestyle and we supported them to become the first eco village in palestine and it's a great joy it's uh, they are very proud of this and they became a model for other palestinian villages um, to become eco villages and also to give them the 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 to be proud of themselves that their actions uh, even if they are not yet named by us as uh, eco village, they are eco village. They are sustainable, regenerative, because this is the the, the folklorian way of being. Yeah, and in my activism is is also to create spaces between Israelis and Palestinians, so we can together co-resist. So it's not this coexistence from upper to lower, but to create spaces where both sides understand that they are actually in the one side in, in one side against a system that want to oppress us but each system is telling each one of us another narrative that in the end of these narratives we have to be enemies and every space every situation that we accept that the other is an enemy by birth just because you are born this and this and this identities at that, at that moment, we became governable for these systems of oppression. We gave them away our power. And to create spaces of um, spiritual engagement, political engagement, also using plant medicine to reawaken to our uh, huge size as human being. But what a gift to earth we can be. So this is part of my activism. I moved to Tamera with a, a group of Israelis and my brother and my daughter. We came to uh, to a place here to, to learn from the community of Tamera so we can establish a, a model like this in what is called Israel-Palestine. And this was the first time that I got to know Jen uh, as a movement. Um, I knew already about um, intentional communities, but not as Jen. And uh, I was invited to participate because they had their gather gathering, I think, 2011 in Tamera itself. And I was so moved. I was so excited, so happy to see all these people from so many places in the world, so many continents. And um, it was a, 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 a moment of um, inner joy. And so I remember myself and my Israeli friend, uh, Uri, speaking with the Kosha Jobert. Uh, and it was like, I told her, Kosha, what we will do is we will make a gen uh, network in Israel, Palestine. This is what we, me and Uri are taking the commitment to do it. And it was clear, we wanted to do it. And we went back to Israel, Palestine with this message to create a network between Israelis, Palestinians and the, the whole countries of the Fertile Crescent. And we got a bomb uh, back in our faces because um, yeah, there was no possibility uh, within that um, political situation to allow a network like this to happen. So with time we matured and uh, we changed also our speech to the outside. So we took out Israel from the equation and I focused my work on Palestine and on Arab countries. Um, yeah, and, and I think this was um, a strategical good step. 
I mean, I think one of the um, foundation of peace work is to be current with what there is, to meet people where they are at, so we can, uh, instead of creating resistance, um, creating an opening. Um, and I'm happy for this opening. With the years, I had many <coughs> connections in Arab countries, um, things that I wouldn't have, also with Iran, with so many places, and also in Palestine. And for many years, I was um, a gen ambassador <clears throat> and took many roles and also um, uh, cooperating with Kosha in, in many places. And today, I, I really um, believe that eco villages um, are a great starting point, an amazing starting point for the whole topic of sustainability and regenerative lifestyle. lifestyle. And I say, Every gen, um, uh, every eco village has to become a, an intentional community. Otherwise, we focus too much on the the technology and techniques how to become regenerative without addressing the human topics. I believe that we are not lacking knowledge in um, permaculture or uh, water um, harvesting or energy. What we are lacking mostly restoring trust, creating safe spaces for conflicts, um, speaking about the human nature or captivity, our behavior in captivity. Who are we when we don't get what we want, when, when we are in trauma, when we are in fear? Who are we and how do we deal with it? How, who are we when we love the same and we don't know how to share? How do we solve it? And without addressing this uh, topic, I think that um, eco villages can lack uh, the main dimension of peace work and liberation. And nevertheless, it's a great start of hope because it brings the reminder of community, of being together, of sharing, um, which is sharing is the antidote for the systems of oppression, the sharing and caring for one another, carrying one another, growing one another is the antidote for the systems of oppression. And it's, it's a great starting point. And maybe in some places in the world, um, the stage of eco village as it is uh, uh, a safe place for regenerative lifestyle is also good, it is okay. But if there are places where we can move into um, intentional community and the community that is caring for the human issues and the sacred in, in it, uh, this would be, that would be my image for growth for eco villages. So um, lately, I participated in in a, a space uh, where. I noticed that coming from where I am and being the person who I am, I uh, sometimes I have a judgment over emotional eruptions. When people go on, I mean, like in, in a way I feel like I can say I have an excuse why it is like this. I'm 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 like I'm so um on fire for change. And often when I look to white people and white privileged people, I say, hey people, come on, use your privilege so we can change the world, so we all can be good. And sometimes I, I meet white people who are so much navel gazing around me and myself and myself and my emotions. And I noticed that um, sometimes I have a, a judgment of, on it. So I was in this gathering and it was for a week and I was really like loved and honored and people came to me and people expressed how much um, I'm a role model for them and so on. So, and few people came and they said, I felt your judgment over me. I wanted to come to you. I, I saw in you uh, a, a person of hope that I can learn from, but I couldn't because I felt your judgment. I felt that I cannot be me in, in your presence. 
And this was repeated by two, three people. And when I went home, I reflected on it and I thought, actually, they are right. I have a judgment. I am I'm not so free in this place. Out of my impatience for change, I can be tough sometimes. And, and there I took a commitment to, um, to have more compassion. So if I can say another spiritual learn that I, I, I learned lately is uh, this ongoing uh, process of healing is to add more compassion to myself and to the situation and to others. And to, um, to see that how many times um, when we reject somebody because of his reactions, we already robbed him the possibility to change because I um, held my, my love from them. And this is not okay. To hold back with our gifts is not okay. In times where, where so many people are homeless from the inside, seeking love, seeking togetherness. If I have a possibility to give and I don't give it, it's not okay. It's equal to the global north accumulating goods and, and things for their comfort and not sharing it. It's the same spectrum. That was shocking for me. And I'm, I'm thankful that it happened. I'm thankful that um, I learned this lesson. that I want to speak about and I, I feel I can speak about. Um, yeah, I think the fact that I uh, came and still connected with the crisis area, I can be uh, an ear and a heart and a consultant for people from the global south for hope, for gaining realistic hope, I call it. Um, as I accompany a lot uh, people from the global north in the issues of um, uh, finding our indigenous ways, um, finding our identities, our global identities, and our native rooted identities. I love to speak about, about becoming indigenous as a as a tool of empowerment. Um, I'm a political activist and part of Defend the Sacred Alliance and a water protector, and I'm a teacher in the whole topic of love, sexuality, and uh, relationships and um, I, I'm happy to uh, give my heart into this, these topics, also knowing how much our um, love longings um, are a big, to a, a big maneuver, a, a big um, issue in our lives and let's talk about it. Yeah, the whole topic of being people of color in white communities, um, well, now I can list so many topics uh, and I love to be challenged also. I want uh, that people that uh, have a question on the things that I didn't li list, um, uh, create a topic and maybe we can learn together. Maybe in the end I will pay them and it's okay.